My name is Mark Lloyd. Uh, I am the uh, director of the Media Policy Initiative at the New America Foundation, uh, very closely affiliated with uh, the Open Technology Institute. Um, and that's probably all the introduction I think I am, I am worth at this point in time. Um, what, what an odd thing to get a doctorate in history and then end up being uh, the leader of the Federal Communications Commission, helping the country move from analog to digital broadcasting as the chairman of the FCC for a very short bit, but very productive bit of time. Um, Commissioner Michael Copps uh, has been a, a hero of mine for many years, and he knows that. He has allowed me into his office to argue about a wide variety of things and provide advice, uh, some of which he uh, decided that he was going to push against on a regular basis uh, when I was in the general counsel's office because he actually knew how I felt about things. He could push me on some of these things. Uh, to say that he has been a public servant is, um, I think, an honor to public service. Um, there have been a few commissioners in the history of the Federal Communications Commission, which is one of the things that I've written about, which have really focused on uh, what might seem to be a fairly simple concept, but is an important one nonetheless, and that's the public interest. And the public interest, uh, while it may change with the new technologies and uh, different gadgets that we might use at home, uh, uh, always involves at least one thing, and that's the public which may or may not be the same as businesses. Uh, and uh, Michael Copps has always known that and has always reminded uh, the Federal Communications Commission, whether he was in charge or whether he was in the majority or the minority, <laughs> that uh, the commissioners were public servants and that their obligation was to look for and, uh, and try to uh, promote the public interest. Um, I think we are honored by his presence today and the fact that he continues to, to push for that. And for all of the students of history <laughs> who are wondering what to do with their careers, I, I, I don't think there's a better uh, role model than, uh, than, Dr., uh, than Dr. Michael Copps. And so with that, let me, uh, let me actually formally begin the program and, uh, and uh, uh, bring Michael Copps up to uh, the podium. and. Uh, sit back in his chair and listen to his good words. Thank you again for coming. Please, now is the applause. <laughs> good morning. morning. And thank you, Mark Lloyd. You can see why Mark is one of my very favorite people. Uh, we did work very, very closely together at the Federal Communications Commission where he was our Chief Diversity Officer. And it was really a, uh, a very happy day for me when, when you arrived there because you brought with you years of experience as a journalist and an advocate, a really an abiding dedication to the uh, public interest and a truly passionate commitment to expanding civil rights in our country and in our communications. The New America Foundation is very fortunate to have you aboard and all of us in the public interest community welcome you back with open arms and with great enthusiasm. Thanks to the New America Foundation and Common Cause for putting this uh, event uh, together and to our panel that will shortly generate what, sh what I am sure will be a very lively discussion. Thank you everyone for taking the time to come here this morning. As uh, many of you know, after I stepped down from the Federal Communications Commission at the end of last year, I joined forces with Common Cause to lead a new media and democracy reform initiative. Bob Edgar, Common Cause's visionary and so very effective president, <coughs> was anxious to have his grassroots group weigh in on the declining state of America's news and information infrastructure, and he provided me with a place I could call home to pursue the issues that mattered most to me. Bob is here this morning, and I want to thank him publicly for that and also for the tremendous work he has led this year to bring accountability 
and transparency and citizen involvement in the 2012 elections. And I want to give him and encourage you to give him a round of applause for that. Our new Media and Democracy Reform Initiative fits perfectly within the Common Cause crusade to get big money out of politics, to bring more citizens into the political process, and to ensure a civic dialogue where we can get the news and information we need to make intelligent decisions for our troubled nation's future. This morning I want to just briefly outline what I see as the four primary and interlocking problems that have already done so much to diminish our political system. They are the role of money in our elections, to which I will devote most of my comments, but I will also briefly talk about the undemocratic distortions caused by congressional redistricting, the action-blocking Senate filibuster rule, and of course the failure of so much of our media to live up to its responsibility to sustain the critical small-d democratic dialogue upon which self-government always rests. We won't fix all of these problems right away, I know that, but our democracy will be tainted until such time as we do. First, the outrageous role of money in our political bloodstream. November 6 brought us good news and bad. Voter participation was better than most experts predicted. Not what a really thriving democracy should have, but better than many expected. The success of progressive causes in many states demonstrated that the strong currents of reform still swirl. Beautiful voices of diversity were heard loudly and clearly. And citizen action was able to limit somewhat the power of dark money. And by the way, when I use that term, dark money, I want to use it broadly. Super PAC dollars that fail to tell us who is really bankrolling all of those brain deadening negative political ads that we were subjected to this year are every bit as dark as undisclosed corporate ads. Telling me that an ad is sponsored by a committee for a sunshiny future doesn't tell me substantially more than not telling me anything at all. It's all dark money. Maybe there are 50 shades of dark but dark is still dark, night is still night, and in this case, political nightmares are still political nightmares. So the bad news is that money ran rampant in the 2012 campaigns. Perhaps as much as $6 billion when it all gets added up. Money continues to run rampant, paying off 2012 campaign debts and positioning itself to collect legislatively for past favors and money is on track to twist and distort the 2014 and 2016 campaigns just as surely and probably more so than it did this year. As Common Cause and many other groups have documented, the mechanics of the electoral process were challenged far and wide in 2012. Restrictive voter ID laws were designed by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and others to minimize participation by minorities. Residents in many low-income precincts had to line up for hours to vote. Intimidating threats about the consequences of voter fraud found their way even onto highway billboards. Ballots were designed so that even a PhD couldn't read through them in the time allotted to vote, which was sometimes as short as five minutes. The list goes on. The president was absolutely right last week when he said, quote, we have to fix that, end quote. I say let's get on with it right now while memories are still fresh. Back to the money. The McCain-Feingold law was a, a good start at much needed reform and disclosure by reining in soft money. Still, dollars found their way in through in independent expenditure loopholes. So the situation was bad enough and then along came the Supreme Court's tortured 2010 Citizens United decision, which made matters dramatically worse by opening the floodgates to unlimited spending by individuals and by corporations. The High Court told us that corporations are people, money is speech, and don't worry, there's not even the appearance of corruption to worry about. 
So groups with nebulous names like Restore Our Future flooded the airways with one ridiculous claim after another. So the floodgates were open. The elections came and went. We all know how they turned out. But from a surprising number of quarters now, we hear musings that Citizens United didn't count so much after all, and that the super PACs and dark money had little impact. That is just plain wrong. Sure, President Obama was reelected. Yes, the balance of power remained relatively the same in Congress, and some good things happened in state and local elections. But do we really think that all those hundreds of millions of special interest dollars didn't matter? Or that suddenly the billionaires have learned their lessons and will cease and desist from trying to buy elections? Come on. Let's take a quick poll. Will everybody in this audience who believes that Karl Rove and the Koch brothers are going away as a result of November 6th, please stand up? <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> So let's dispense with that nonsense before it takes further hold. Declaring victory against dark money may be inviting dark disaster next time around. A few facts should suffice. A closer look uncovers numbers that are deeply troublesome to anyone who cares about the influence of special interests in our democracy. OpenSecrets.org reports that in 93% of House races, the campaign and affiliated independent groups that spent the most money won, 93%. That's not any statistical outlier. It's hard data indicating that the next Congress will be just as beholden to special interest money as the last, if that is we, the people, don't act. On top of that, we know those dark money interests aren't looking for a one-night stand between big business and the politicians that they support. Winning the election is just the price of admission to a much longer running affair. Not an affair of the heart, but an affair aimed at influencing policy, legislation, and the extent of government oversight. The most pernicious influence of campaign spending, as we all know, comes not on election day, but after election day. That's when the real scandals start. Special interest donors who contributed six or seven figures are looking for a return on their investment. And they're looking real hard when that special interest amendment comes before a congressional or state house or local committee or subcommittee or council or whatever it is. Their access is taken for granted. Seldom are questions asked when there's a knock on the door in that congressman's office for an audience with those to whom they have given so much because they want so much. So let's be clear, some may be worried about the appearance of influence peddling, but we, what we need to be a lot more worried about is the reality of influence peddling. At no time in this country's political history has big money played a more important role than it did in 2012. And left untouched, the role of big money isn't going to get smaller it's only going to get smarter. Dark money donors may have made some dumb investments this year, but the political market remains as critical to them as the stock market, and you may be sure that there's a lot of strategizing going on right now, probably right this minute as we're gathered here, about how they can reap a higher return on their investment next time around. I believe this is an issue that goes beyond whether you are Democratic or Republican. And if that's not clear, we need to fix it and make clear right away because I believe citizens of all political persuasions are appalled at how much influence is wielded by so few. Republicans and Democrats alike turn to dark money to raise unlimited dollars and to blast opponents mercilessly. President Obama was attending fundraisers, one report said, at a rate of one every 60 hours. Citizens United is a bipartisan problem that compels a bipartisan solution. My advice here is to strike early, and that means now, with a reform program that has the consensus support of all the public interest groups in this town and others who have expressed their frustration 
with what our campaigns have become. Lots of groups have identified the problem. Now is the time to do something about it. Before Congress convenes in January, there ought to be a specific proposal ready for presentation to the Congress, endorsed by an impossible to ignore breadth of organizations and individuals. And it should cover what I've talked about this morning and more. Limits on money, full disclosure of contributions, getting a constitutional amendment rolling, simplifying the voting process, ensuring that casting a ballot is quick, easy, and totally non-intimidating. I saw an interesting survey the other day with regard to having national standards for elections were in the bottom line was 88% of Americans would support that. Meanwhile, while this process unfolds, I renew my call, and I hope a lot of you will join in, in demanding that the Federal Communications Commission use the authority it already has in Section 317 of the Telecommunications Act to drill much farther down to disclose the true sponsors of political advertisements. The law clearly states that political ads, quote, must fully and fairly disclose the true identity of the person or persons or corporation, committee, association, or other unincorporated group or other entity, end quote, paying for them. Why? Again, quoting the statute, quote, because listeners are entitled to know by whom they are being persuaded, end quote. So listing that Committee for a Sunshiny Future that I mentioned as a sponsor of an ad doesn't get us anywhere close to the kind of disclosure that Section 317 envisions. And you know what? There's a chance that the Supreme Court might just bless the FCC doing its job here because the Citizens United decision made quite a deal about disclosure as an antidote to all the money the decision allowed in to the campaign bloodstream. We could call their bluff. As I said at the outset, money in politics is one of four great challenges that tarnish our electoral process, and I promise to be much briefer about the other three challenges. The second challenge is the distortion caused by politics-driven congressional redistricting. It's interesting that Democrats won the congressional vote nationwide, but will still have some 39 fewer seats than the Republicans come January. The current system is brazenly undemocratic and nakedly partisan because it packs voters into gerrymandered districts that are designed exclusively to keep one party or the other in control. It's a democratic sin as well as a Republican sin. These politically motivated maps mean fewer, far fewer, genuine swing districts. Very often, members in seats considered safe in a general election are much more afraid of a primary challenge, and they have a perverse incentive to engage in hyperpartisanship to ward off that primary challenge. So at a time when we need bipartisan cooperation more than ever, gerrymandering actually encourages partisanship and deadlock, and it makes a mockery of the idea of one person, one vote. California made real progress in addressing this issue this year. I hope our public interest groups will give this issue the priority it deserves because our democracy is seriously eroded by the failure to do something about the redistricting mess. Challenge number three is the Senate filibuster. There is neither rationale nor excuse for a tiny minority's ability to bring the entire edifice of government to a screeching halt, especially over matters that were never intended by the Founding Fathers to require a super majority. The Constitution was very clear on matters that required more than a majority for passage. But the overwhelming bulk of what is held up nowadays has absolutely no relationship to what the Constitution demarcated. During my years working for the great Senator Fritz Hollings, and for many generations before that, the filibuster was rarely deployed. Legislators worked hard to whip votes fair and square, 
And when they were behind in the count, they didn't end run the Constitution to keep the other side from winning. But right now, issues with broad public support like campaign finance reform are snarled by this blatantly anti-democratic parlor trick. My colleagues at Common Cause are working hard to reform the filibuster, and I hope they succeed. And I'm also pleased to hear that Senator Reid is at least talking about addressing this issue in the new Congress. I hope he succeeds. Our country confronts a magnitude of problems, the severity of which has seldom been matched in our history. And with one of our legislative bodies always at the mercy of a little band of willful blockers tackling these problems and achieving what are bound to be very difficult compromises is simply going to be beyond our reach. The fourth great challenge to restoring our democracy is media itself. Media, that's where most of these campaign dollars end up, isn't it? Campaign 2012 was a bonanza for media. They were huge winners. But more than broadcaster profits, a functioning democracy <coughs> demands an informed electorate. That is its very prerequisite. For a long time, we had a press that held, po held the power accountable, that dug for facts, that called out distortions, that pressed for truth. And that was then. Right now, much of our media is failing the most basic task at hand, and that is to provide voters with the high quality news, information, and deep accountability journalism that we must have in order to s decide the country's future course. But too often, balance has replaced the contest of considered thought, antagonistic questions. Glitz has replaced substance, opinion has replaced fact, spin replaces truth. And sadly, our consolidated media monoliths have little incentive or encouragement to produce real news. Investigative journalism is expensive, costs money, it's hard work. Talking heads are much cheaper, and closing newsrooms, well, that proves to Wall Street that you're really serious about achieving those efficiencies and economies that pump up the bottom line. And we've seen that played out dozens and hundreds of times over the last 30 years. So I'll spare you the speech, which all of you know I would really like to launch into right now, and try to distill it into a, a couple of uh, sentences of what I think is essential here. One is to put the brakes on more media consolidation and telecommunications consolidation. And the other is to assert some honest to God public interest oversight of our news and information ecosystem. The fact that the FCC may be on the brink of further loosening our media ownership limits right now and shutting down still more local voices is more than distressing. And even worse has been the strange reluctance of the commission to do something about the lack of diversity in our broadcast media. And this is also teed up in the item pending before the commission right now. And I don't mean just diversity of opinion, but diversity of ownership. In a country that is more than one-third minority, the fact that only 2.2 percent, and this new figure was just released by the FCC the other day, 2.2 percent of full-power commercial TV stations are owned by minorities is nothing short of a national disgrace. Every public interest group in this room, every civil rights group in this room and around this town ought to be weighing in on what is shaping up in the days and weeks just ahead in the FCC's quadrennial review of media ownership rules as a tragic lost opportunity to repair the damage caused by so many years of public policy failure. And we shouldn't have to say, well, the Third Circuit Court will take care of it again, so let's not worry about it uh, uh, right now. Uh, we shouldn't be letting it get that far. No agency of government or 
room filled with concerned advocates can solve these four great challenges that bedevil our nation. They're fundamental challenges, steep hills to climb. We know the power of those who oppose us. We understand the corrupting influence of big money. But we've also learned that even amidst all the special interest power, the grassroots can still prevail. And they'd prevail a lot more if we could make progress on this new citizen's agenda that I've just outlined today. I believe that when our people come to see the interrelatedness of these challenges, and that understands how directly they get in the way of the common good, they will come to demand that they be fixed. Different issues demand different strategies, perhaps different timetables, but they are in truth one agenda, an agenda for democratic reform. I don't delude myself that change will be easy or that a series of speeches or even a new media and democracy reform initiative will get it done. But Citizens United, lowercase c, lowercase u, a real Citizens United can get it done. All of it done. So our job, yours and mine, is to, pre is to present an agenda that speaks to these shortfalls, that has priorities and timetables to achieve our goals, and that takes the battle not just to the halls of Congress, but first and foremost to citizens across the land. Reform from the top down is not going to deliver on any of these four great challenges, let alone on an agenda that encompasses them all. Success may not come all at once, it may come, may have to come incrementally, but our agenda should transcend the incremental. Our vision should go beyond the incremental. It's got to hold out the vision and the promise of self-government, of our belief that the strength of diversity is growing now that new voices are being added to the chorus of the people, and that we may be seeing at long, long last a gathering opportunity for democratic renewal and democratic reform. I don't know about you, but that's why I'm back at it, and that's why I am convinced that now is the time for coordinated action against dark money rigged redistricting, filibustering deadlocks, and media too often failing its basic responsibility to nourish informed citizenship. Is that a, an ambitious agenda? Yes, it is. You bet. I think it's worth a try, don't you? Thank you very much. <laughs> not telling you anything you don't know. It's 1025. We're going to wrap up here at, as I said, at noon, which means we're going to have a panel discussion for roughly uh, 30, 45 minutes or so. Um, and I'm going to ask the panelists to come up, and we can uh, begin very shortly. And while they're doing that, let me uh, be sure to thank uh, uh, Todd O'Boyle and uh, uh, Doug and uh, Tim Carr, I don't think uh, Tim is here, Liz, um, and other folks who've really sort of helped pull this together. Uh, again, the New America Foundation is honored to host this event, but it really has been uh, free press and common cause uh, and the Sunlight Foundation uh, that have made this possible. Um, our topic, uh, as Commissioner Copps uh, said, is dark money, media, and the 2012 campaign. This is the first presidential election uh, since Citizens United, um, a decision that uh, a Republican appointed uh, Associate Justice 
um, uh, said was uh, a democracy cannot function effectively when its constituent members believe laws are being bought and sold. That was Justice Stevens' dissent. So part of the conversation about what's happened with Citizens United, I think, can be divided perhaps into two separate strands. One strand is, has dark money, has the influence of super PACs and other people contributing to, uh, uh, I, I would guess, the candidate of their choice, whether it's at the national level or the local level, have they so overwhelmed the process that they have distorted our political discussion? Has dark money had an impact on how we talk about our issues and our candidates? And the other issue is related but separate, which is does dark money represent a corrupting influence down the line, which may be different than the conversation that we have, but is more about what happens after the election. And we have a panelist today who I think are more than able to address both strands of those uh, particular issues. Um, and I'm, why don't I introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak, so I'll trust that you'll remember this. Uh, Matea Gold, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is a Washington correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. She left the media beat at the LA Times and joined the DC Bureau of the Tribune in 2010. In addition to covering media, Gold is a veteran political reporter, having covered the campaigns of Al Gore and John Kerry, Howard Dean, uh, Joe Lieberman, and others. Jason Reifler, who's not sitting next to Matea, <laughs> will be speaking next after Matea. Uh, Jason is an assistant professor of political science at Georgia State University. He studies political behavior with a great chunk of his time devoted to uh, political opinion, voting behavior, and the misperceptions of the electorate, if I have that correctly. This includes research he's engaged in with uh, his colleague, uh, Brenda Nine, who, uh, for the New America Foundation, uh, funded by Omidyar, is uh, looking at misrepresentation and how to correct it. Uh, in his spare time, he teaches political, psycho uh, political psychology, war, and public opinion, and helps his wife raise his daughter. So. Craig Aaron is, uh, needs little introduction, I think, before this crowd. He's the president and CEO of Free Press and uh, the Free Press Action Fund. Is that right? That's right. Wow. The national nonpartisan nonprofit organization, media reform group, par excellence. Uh, before joining Free Press, he was, believe it or not, an investigative reporter. This is what's happened in investigative reporting these days. For Public Citizens, Congress Watch, and the managing editor of In These Times magazine. Editor of two books, Appeal to Reason, 25 Years of In These Times, and Changing Media, Public Interest, Politics, or Policies for the Digital Age. A graduate of Northwestern's highly noted Medill School of Journalism. Ellen Miller, a former uh, board member of, uh, we served on uh, one of my favorite boards, OMB Watch, for a little time. She is now the executive director and co-founder of the Sunlight Foundation. We could use a little more of that. Nonpartisan, nonprofit institution dedicated to using power of the internet to catalyze greater government openness and transparency. Ellen is also the founder of two other prominent organizations toiling in the fields of money and politics, the Center for Responsive Politics and Public Campaign. Ellen was the publisher of TomPain.com and was a senior fellow at the American Prospect. She also writes every now and then, I think, for the Huffington Post and a wide variety of other places, so you are able to see her work. She's also spent a good deal of time working on Capitol Hill. Um, Again, we have, uh, I think, an excellent panel able to address these questions. I'm not sure they all agree. Um, but why don't we start with uh, a political reporter, Matea? So I'll leave that to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I come from a slightly different perspective than most of the folks on this board. I am an, obviously an independent reporter, not an advocate in this fight. But I've had an opportunity to watch this play out over the last two election cycles up close since my beat is money and politics. So it's been pretty fascinating. Um, I wanted to step back briefly just to talk about how 
we got here, because I think both those of us in the media and um, the reform community too often use this shorthand of a post-Citizens United world. Um, it actually is a little more complicated, as um, these things often are. There were two major federal court cases in 2010 that um, basically created this landscape that we're now in. One, obviously, is the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United, which decreed that corporations could actually spend their uh, corporate dollars on direct political advocacy. They couldn't um, give money to candidates, but they could sp spend money independently. And that was a, a, a huge change um, after a, a century ban on that kind of spending that came out of the Gilded Age. But there was another court decision that I actually think might have been even more influential um, on, in in leading to what we've seen happen with outside money, and that is a court of appeals decision um, called Speech Now, in which the federal court decided that people could pool together unlimited sums of money and spend it on independent political activity. Essentially, instead of having be limited at $5,000 contributions for a traditional PAC, you could create what has now become known as a super PAC, which was coined by a colleague of mine at Roll Call. So uh, super PACs, obviously, I think, have been one of the uh, biggest drivers of this outside spending. Um, and Citizens United, I think, led to what we've seen as a lot of politically active tax exempt groups take a bigger role in campaigns. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how I think those of us in the media um, have tried to watch this phenomena. Uh, as the commissioner said, spending is on track for the 2012 campaign to reach a record $6 billion. Um, that's according to the Center for Responsive Politics, which provides us with so much amazing information that Ellen, Ellen started. Um, that is up from $5.3 billion in 2008. And the big driver of that spending are outside groups. So outside groups reported spending more than a billion dollars. That's three times as much they spent in the last presidential campaign. And that includes $307 million spent by 150 tax-exempt advocacy groups, which purportedly do not have politics as their primary purpose. Um, so this has really been um, the area in which we've seen this dark money flow into the system. These groups do not have to disclose their donors, unlike super PACs. And we really know very little about them and even who set them up. Most of them don't have to file their initial paperwork um, reporting kind of their, their board or even um, who their founder is until a year, a year and a half after the election. Um, organizations like this, such as Americans for Prosperity, which we know has gotten backing from the Koch brothers, uh, Crossroads GPS, which is an arm of um, American Crossroads, which was co-founded by Karl Rove on the left, a group called Patriot Majority. Um, these groups have also spent money that they did not have to report. So um, we talk a lot about um, this is a big iceberg that we only see kind of probably um, a fraction of it out of the water. We don't really know how much of it is under the water, but it's safe to say that we're probably hundreds of millions of dollars spent by tax exempt groups that we were not was were not reported to the FEC this this cycle. Uh, so what we really saw in this campaign was the center of gravity shift from traditional camp can campaigns and parties to these outside groups. Uh, that had a huge impact on those of us in the press that try to make the connection between um, candidates and campaigns and the interests that are supporting them uh, made it so much more difficult for us to actually try to draw the connection between those forces, those funding forces, and um, the, the candidates themselves. And um, it, it made for a fun hunt, I have to say. Every time there were uh, the campaign filings on the 20th of the month, the um, super PACs, I, I disagree slightly with Commissioner Copps. I don't think they're really dark, maybe slightly gray. Uh, but they <laughs> they do have to report their donors, so it's, it's up to us in the media to tell the public who those are. And I like to think we, we were pretty aggressive about that. Um, some of them, of course, got money from corporate shells, and we had to play a little detective game to find that out. Um, one of my favorite stories was actually a tip we got from CRP. They discovered that a new nonprofit had sprung up in the 2010 cycle. It was called the Center to Protect Patient Rights, and it was basically a post office post office box outside of Phoenix. Um, they had transferred $55 million to 26 conservative nonprofits in the 2010 cycle, which, of course, we found out you know, a year and a half after that election. So we spent a long time digging into that and were able to piece together connection between the center and um, the Koch brothers. Several of their operatives had actually set up the group and on its board um, 
of course, no one would talk to us. And um, they kind of disappeared from sight until we found out they were part of kind of a daisy chain of money transferred into two California referendum fights this year. Um, they helped funnel $11 million into California to fight some initiatives uh, there. So that's the kind of detective work that we've been trying to do. Um, but granted, we can't track all these groups down. So, and I, I would say that there there is an incredible challenge because there are so many fewer media outlets devoted to investigative <coughs> reporting and I think that the risk is especially at the congressional level because many groups uh, many many news organizations just don't have the resources to track down these groups uh, briefly I just want to address this idea of whether the super PAC money um, was a big fail in this election. Um, we wrote about how there was this surprise that all of these hundreds of millions of dollars that supported Governor Romney didn't work. Um, I think that in some ways we probably all shouldn't be that surprised that money on its own doesn't work. We've seen many a self-funded candidate um, pour hundreds of millions or tens of millions of dollars into a campaign, Linda McMahon, in this election for one and, and not succeed. Um, and I think there's several reasons that um, the super PACs and the tax exempt groups that back Governor Romney had some challenges. One is obviously that a, a campaign comes down to a candidate and whether they can connect with voters. Um, so I think that's a big part of the equation. But they also, I think there's a, there's a real argument to be made that there actually were too many groups advocating for him on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And there was kind of a cacophony of messages. We saw at some point, points in the summer, there were groups running ads attacking Obama on the debt and Solyndra and his purported gutting of welfare reform. And I think you could really, as a television viewer, just kind of start tuning them all out at a certain point. Um, but there, I, I think it is important to note that even while money on one side of the aisle did not seem to have an effect in this election, it had a huge impact overall on the campaign. It created a financial arms race that I think set us on a trajectory that is not going to stop unless we see a real change in the law. Um, President Obama's campaign and his affiliated committees raised more than a billion dollars, and that was largely in response to these outside groups. They went up early on the air in the summer. They spent $300 million on television ads because they wanted to get ahead of the onslaught. Governor Romney spent almost all his time scrambling to fundraise to keep up. He was even fundraising after Labor Day when most of the candidates really want to just be focused on public events. Um, so I think money took over this election in a way that we haven't seen before. And I, I do agree that these folks are here to stay now. Even the groups who are on the losing end of the equation this time have talked about getting engaged in the fiscal cliff fight. They are really promising to become effectively uh, shadow political parties. And uh, we're not going to know really who's behind most of them um, ever unless there is some forced disclosure. Um, and many of them, I think, that were kind of even more in the shadows will probably just fade away and um, there's little chance that we're going to be able to track them down. Um, some things to look for on the horizon, there's already a lot of chatter about the need to roll back contribution limits to parties in order to have a quote more even playing field. The RNC is really pushing this. There's a case before the Supreme Court right now in which they want to get rid of the aggregate contribution limit on how much people can give to federal campaigns and really they're making the case that, hey, parties should be able to raise unlimited sums too if super PACs can. Um, and on the other side of the equation, we're actually seeing some real fight for disclosure on the state level. Um, this money that the Center to Protect Patient Rights helped funnel into California has now triggered a major investigation there. There are several uh, attorneys general in various states that are pushing for politically active nonprofits to have to disclose more. So I think that could be a front in which we actually see some disclosure um, possibly in the coming years. And there's actually now, I think, a good case to be made that there's some real backlash among voters against this money. Um, one of the reasons that um, some of these two referendums failed in California was because there was this really strong argument made by Governor Brown that these shadowy outside groups are coming in and trying to manipulate you. And I think that really resonates with voters now. People, we, you know, we have devoted so much um, time to trying to cover this issue, and I do think that even if 
there's not as many media outlets being able to do the digging. People are very aware of this phenomena. I wouldn't be surprised to see Super PAC in the dictionary next year. And so I think that this is starting to penetrate and that um, some strategists are now saying that it's actually probably not a benefit to have this kind of money on their side because it can be used against them. So that's all I want to say. Thanks. Jason. Okay, so I think I've been invited to talk some about misperception. So along with my co-author, Brendan Nyhan, we've spent a lot of time trying to focus on the extent to which it's possible to correct the misperceptions that citizens hold. So when people believe things about the world that are in fact not true, is it possible for us to correct them? And the way that this may relate back to uh, money spent in politics is that if that money is spent primarily on campaign commercials and campaign commercials communicate messages to the public that this may be a vehicle in which misperceptions are spread or in which people get information that is, um, well, to slightly paraphrase one of my all-time favorite movies, Blood Simple, um, not strictly accurate. Um, and there are reasons that we might want to be concerned about super PACs and other less regulated sources of um, campaign money. One thing that we know from social psychology research is that misperceptions, once you have them, are quite durable. So in perhaps the canonical uh, experiment, some social psychologists at Stanford University in the 70s gave uh, students a stack of 25 suicide notes and then predetermined through random <laughs> assignment that half of the students were going to be told that they were really good at distinguishing real from fake suicide notes and half of them were going to be told that they were really bad at distinguishing real from fake suicide notes. They were told that these were a mix of real and fake and that they had to identify which ones were real, which ones were fake. And what happened is they got this feedback then the social psychologist said, you know, that feedback we gave you, we totally made it up. <clears throat> Some of you were just told, predetermined, you were going to get uh, told that you were good. Some of you were going to be told that you were bad. And then they asked them, how do you think you will do in the future if you were given this task? And the people who were told that they were really good, even though it was not related to performance at all, thought that they would be really, really good at being able to distinguish real from fake suicide notes. And the people who were told that they were bad in the future thought that they wouldn't be as good at distinguishing real from fake suicide notes. And that there are analogs to politics. So in research that I did with uh, Brendan Nyhan and another co-author, uh, Michael Cobb, we've shown that this same problem also relates to politics. If you learn that somebody has done something, and in particular learn something that you don't like, and then later take away and say, oh, it turns out that was a mistake. That, has, that information that we gave you the, that this member of a state legislature in our experiment didn't block a bill that you really would have liked. We did our experiment with college students, so it was related to college aid. That while their opinions of that state legislator went up compared to when they were told that they had done something bad, it didn't go all the way back up to an initial evaluation. So there was still this belief perseverance. They evaluate a state legislator, they're told something bad, that bad information is taken away, and the perceptions of that state legislator don't go all the way back up to the initial um, evaluation. Now, there isn't asymmetry. We also tested the other way around. What happens if you say that a politician did something really good and then take that away? In that case, people are able to correct. In fact, they overcorrect. So. <clears throat> There's not an incentive for politicians to go out and be excessively boastful, thinking that, oh, once it's taken away, everything's going to be great. There actually seems to be some degree of, of punishment for that. Additional research that Brenda and I have done has focused on directly trying to correct misperceptions. So if you believe something that's wrong, can we give you information that will have you update so that you now believe things that are correct? And so in one of our experiments, we gave everybody information about um, a speech that uh, George Bush had made when he was president, saying that his tax cuts had, in fact, increased government revenue. 
half of the respondents were given an additional piece of information. That is, showing that, in fact, the Bush tax cuts of 2001 and 2003 did not increase government revenue. The government revenue was lower after those tax cuts. And an interesting thing happened. Giving that information to liberals made them less accepting of the claim that the tax cuts increased government revenue. So compared to people who didn't get the correction, liberals told that, in fact, the Bush tax cuts did not uh, increase revenue, changed their beliefs. Among conservatives, being told that the Bush tax cuts did not increase government revenue and actually cut government revenue actually led them to believe more strongly that the Bush tax cuts had increased government revenue. So that when people are given information that runs counter to their political beliefs, counter to their predispositions, that people bring mental effort to bear on this and that they actually try and counter argue the information that they're getting, which may paradoxically lead them to believe that which is wrong more strongly because you've tried to correct them in the first place. So corrections are difficult. People engage in motivated reasoning. Now, as horrible as this sounds, and it does sound pretty horrible, that ironically, this may actually also serve us well in some ways. Because people engage in motivated reasoning, because when they're given persuasive arguments, that they're not just blank slates in which they easily accept anything that they're told, that Getting lots of extra campaign commercials from the other side probably isn't going to move you around all that much. So while there's lots of money being spent, it's not clear that that money is being spent all that well. And it's not just choices about are we spending money on the right candidates, are we putting it in the correct races, are we spending it in the correct ways. It may just be that any persuasive message, there's lots of people that it's not going to reach. And if it reaches them, it may actually be counterproductive. So corrections can be really difficult. In some odd way, that actually might be a boon as well. Now, there are other ways that um, dark money might matter and matter in really negative ways, apart from directly trying to um, buy influence or, or buy policy. One is that we could think of if we have this process where more and more money is being spent, more and more money being spent on persuasive messages, largely spent attacking the other side, even if it's not persuading, that it may be poisoning a political environment to such a degree that um, the opportunities for political compromise just don't exist. That the political environment becomes so poisoned and the sides become so hardened in their views. It's not the persuasion would work and would get people to necessarily change their minds. It just, you get so hardened into your position that any movement away from that is such a loss that compromise becomes impossible. And I also agree that even to the extent that money may not be effective, money's probably not going to go away. Because the one situation where it might be effective is if one side has a huge spending advantage over the other side. So I'm not sure. Who here has ever heard of the dollar auction before? I'll briefly explain what a dollar auction is. It's a tool that economists like to use. So pretend that I take a, I work at a state university, so I'm not actually going to do this, but pretend that I take a dollar out of my wallet. <laughs> and I say, you can bid whatever you want for it, and whoever has the top bid gets that dollar. But there's a catch. Whoever has the second highest bid also has to pay whatever their highest bid was. So once people start bidding, you may think, you know what, one dollar, I bid one penny, no big deal. The next person says, I'll bid two cents. I still, that's a huge return on investment. I would bid two cents, I'd have to pay two cents, and I could get back a dollar. And as long as you are still beneath a dollar, it makes sense to go ahead and keep bidding. But then what, the amazing thing is once you get to a dollar, People keep bidding. <laughs> so you go back and forth, 99, 97 cents, 98, 99, a dollar. And the person who was left at 99 realizes, wait a second. 
If I don't bid a dollar one, I'm going to have to pay 99 cents and get nothing. And so more and more money gets being spent, and yet what initially looked like it might be a large return on investment, because you're spending a lot, and if you're able to spend a lot when the other side isn't, then you are able to collect a lot from it. But once both sides start doing it, it's just this arms race that accumulates more and more and more, um, and then maybe that gets back to some of the, the other problems, um, like all this money being spent truly poisoning political communication or political discourse in a way that makes compromise or deal making extremely difficult or possibly even um, impossible. So I will stop. <laughs> Craig. All right. Um, wow, so we go from suicide notes. I think I see why they <laughs> use those in that experiment. But uh, um, So I'm going to try to be here uh, also on behalf of Citizens for a Sunshiny Future. Um, <laughs> uh, and talk a little bit, you know, if we're going to talk about money uh, in the election, we have to talk about the media. Uh, we know something like 60 cents on every dollar being spent in the election is going into buying media. Pretty clear that media <clears throat> are part of the problem. And I don't think it's really an overstatement to say that increasingly the media are complicit in the damage being done to our democracy. Uh, don't get me wrong, I think there's a lot of good journalism being done out there, being done on the 2012 election. I'm sure we could list dozens of excellent pieces from the Los Angeles Times, from the New York Times, NPR, you name it. Uh, you know, Mother Jones Magazine had a scoop that we could argue maybe turned the election when they uh, got their hands on that 47% video. Uh, fact checking was in vogue this election cycle. We had Pinocchios and pants on fire and sort of that ultimate seal of approval which was presidential candidates calling out fact checkers and saying they were ignoring them, which, you know, pro tip means they actually weren't. Um, but the dominant media experience for most people when it came to the election was that advertising. I mean, God help you if you lived in a swing state or one of its neighbors. Uh, on the other hand, if you were a TV station owner, 2012 was like winning the lottery. Uh, that's actually a direct quote from a former NBC News executive. And, uh, you know, we expect that once we've counted all up, these broadcasters will have taken in $3 billion from the election. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that that is not a story that you heard a lot about when you were watching local television. Uh, my colleague Tim Carr, uh, who's in the back, Tim, maybe wave your hand so people can find you. Uh, he, he did a series of reports this year looking at uh, the ads and what was actually on the news. Uh, this built on the work uh, of a project that we did with the Sunlight Foundation to actually send people out to find out, you know, what were stations actually putting on the air, what were in the advertising records. Some of those became available as the cycle went on for a long time. You had to actually go down to a station and ask them to open up those dusty filing cabinets and dig in, and we had people doing it. And, and when we got that information back, uh, when we were able to use these other resources, we found that in places like Milwaukee, in the hundreds of hours of coverage that led up to that June 5th gubernatorial recall, uh, there were zero stories, zero, on the 17 groups most actively buying time on the major affiliates. Uh, at the same time, during that same time period we studied, there were 53 stories about Justin Bieber. Uh, so, so they were hard at work. Uh, Charlotte, Cleveland, Las Vegas, uh, we found no fact checking of any of the claims uh, that the super PACs and, of, of the super PACs and independent groups that were spending the most. In Tampa, an exception, one story. Uh, Denver has been held up rightfully as a, as a market where fact checking was happening on television. Uh, but when we went in to look at the two months that led up to the presidential debate in Denver, uh, we found that for every minute of news coverage about those groups and spending, there were 162 minutes of advertising. And worse still, the stations, even those stations doing fact checking, uh, they continued to air the ads that their own reporters found were false or misleading. And that's a big problem because a lot more people were seeing those ads than were seeing those reports. And look, stations, they can reject inaccurate ads from independent and third party groups, not candidates, but the independent and third party groups in the same way that they could be rejecting uh, consumer products that make false claims. Uh, but, they, but they don't do it. Uh, and I think they won't do it 
until they're feeling more pressure from viewers, until they're feeling more pressure from their peers, and until they're feeling some real pressure from the supposed watchdogs down at places like the Federal Communications Commission. These stations are friends, the broadcasters, the number one source of news in every survey when it comes to where people find out about their elections. Uh, they love to wrap themselves in the flag and the First Amendment anytime their motives are questioned. They will talk your ear off about all the toys for tots drives that they do and the Amber Alerts and the round the clock storm and hurricane coverage and good for them for doing it. But I think increasingly we need to be demanding a storm team to contend with the deluge of lies, with the hurricane of misinformation that we're all staring at in every single election. It's about accountability and I think we should be raising our expectations that stations need to be accountable and putting those record profits, that $3 billion, back into cutting through the spin and actually reporting on the issues. Uh, we also need, in addition to that accountability, more transparency. I do want to give some credit to the Federal Communications Commission uh, for finally forcing, after a long fight, the network stations in the biggest markets to put their public and political files online. That was a major accomplishment. Those were invaluable records to researchers and reporters. And now there are things we could do to make them better. Uh, the FCC should be listening to my friends at the Sunlight Foundation about how to make these things actually searchable, machine readable, uh, more user friendly, so that by 2014, when not just the top 50 markets, but every station, including the Spanish language station, small markets, should be online with these records, they could be more useful. Now, Perhaps the biggest obstacle we need to remove there is the fact that even after we saw there was no real burden to putting these records online, even after we saw how useful they were to journalists, including television journalists, uh, the National Association of Broadcasters is still suing the FCC, still fighting basic common sense transparency. Uh, the fact that this lawsuit continues, I mean, it's, I think it's really shameful, it's preposterous, they should drop it. I think they're going to lose. I'm confident they will lose in court, but it would be better for all of us if they just gave up these ridiculous arguments about this burden and started acting like the news organizations that they're supposed to be. That would be a great first step. That would even maybe get us halfway there. I think the next step, as Commissioner Kopp suggested uh, in his opening remarks, is that we need to look at updating our policies. The Communications Act makes very clear that viewers and listeners are, quote, entitled to know by whom they are being persuaded. And, you know, if all we're telling people is that this, you know, this ad was brought to them by, I don't know, puppies and kittens against Barack Obama or <laughs> rodeo clowns for Romney, the Committee for Truth in Politics, that one's actually real, uh, the viewers have no idea. Uh, and it was, we heard about these studies that show that, you know, people you know, w w the, people are more likely to properly discredit information if they are aware of a source's lack of credibility when they first receive that information. Once you start telling them later on the side after the ad's been on the air for three weeks, it just doesn't stick. Uh, so I think from a policy perspective, what we need to look at is a pretty simple and obvious answer. People need to, at least for a start, see who is actually sponsoring these messages. I, again, I think uh, there's been a, a fair bit of work done on, on what this should look like. How about a standalone disclaimer in the body of ads that names at least the top four contributors to the organization or entity sponsoring the advertisement? That would give us some information when Crossroads GPS or Restore Our Future uh, puts an ad on the air. Uh, you, you can limit this, you should limit this to say uh, the names of those who contributed more than 25% of the organization's budget in the previous year. Or uh, perhaps instead the top four donors uh, if they gave the groups at least $10,000 uh, in the previous year. You need to make sure that those disclosures are legible, that they're on the air long enough that you can actually see and hear them. Uh, and you need to make it clear that that rule is not just for federal races, uh, that's the, the FCC's jurisdiction does not stop there, but the state contests, the ballot initiatives, and those issue ads that, as, as Matea suggested, a lot of these groups are moving in straight into this kind of issue advocacy um, where, you know, even more misleading tactics are at play because there aren't, the political consultants aren't necessarily looking to take credit in the moment uh, like they might be in a presidential race. Uh, the, the great part of this plan, of this idea, is that we could do it right now. Uh, 
It just requires really an exceedingly modest change to existing sponsorship identification rules at the FCC. Uh, in fact, there's already a petition sitting at the FCC to do this. Andy Schwartzman, uh, formerly of Media Access Project, has filed that petition. It's there. It's stuck in a drawer. Um, so we've, we've freed the files uh, in some ways. I think it's time that we demand that we open that drawer. Uh, I think we could, we could start there. We could do it tomorrow. Uh, maybe not tomorrow, Monday. Um, <laughs> we, we could get started. Uh, that's fine. I'll give you a week. Uh, I, I think that would be the simplest and, and perhaps, you know, best reform we could do. There are, there are elements of this in the Disclose Act and larger pieces of legislation, but this is very doable and could be carried out by the Federal Communications Commission and, and would be cheered by so many of those viewers who are sick and tired of watching those ads. Now, now that's not the only thing we should do. There are larger issues to wrestle with. Commissioner Copps talked about it. Uh, there's a much bigger conversation about how to contend with Citizens United and these other court cases. There's a much longer conversation about a set of policies we should actually pursue to support more local journalism. Uh, maybe we'll get into some of that. Uh, the one thing I do want to flag, because it's very relevant right now to what the Federal Communications Commission is doing, is that the very worst thing we can do, the one thing we shouldn't do, is encourage more media consolidation. I just can't see, having just lived through this election, uh, how we're going to be better served, how our democracy is going to be better served, if somebody like Rupert Murdoch fresh off his phone hacking scandal, is allowed to buy the Los Angeles Times, along with two television stations, along with eight radio stations in the same market. But that's essentially what the Federal Communications Commission has been reported in the trades in the last couple of days. That's essentially what they're proposing, to open the door where that kind of deal is possible. I don't know how political coverage is going to improve if we're allowing a company like Sinclair Broadcasting to, bro to put on the air, you know, this thinly veiled partisan propaganda right before the election in multiple markets, dozens of markets, on multiple stations because they're operating more than one stations. And yet the FCC, after all these years, after hearing time and again that 99% of the public opposes further media consolidation, they seem strangely unconcerned. Uh, Unlike some of my fa fellow panelists here, I am not a doctor. Uh, but it seems that the last thing we need is more of the same bad medicine that has gotten us so sick in the first place. We need a new prescription, and we need it stat. I'll leave it there. Thanks. I was, I was told yesterday that I get to, uh, to bat cleanup, so this is not such an easy task. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll put a little more, um, uh, a, f a few more details and, and, and maybe make a few additional points from my colleagues. Um, uh, first of all, the Sunlight Foundation uh, is a, um, a relative newcomer in the world of uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, we are just um, uh, approaching our seventh birthday. We're committed to improving government ac uh, access to government information using technology. And we do this work, I want to add, uh, in the context of how technology is driving a dramatic transformation between the power of individuals, the role of government, and the relationship between citizens and the state. Um, before our eyes, there are new ways of identifying problems, of gathering information, and, and uh, Craig mentioned some of how we gathered information uh, during the election. New ways of organizing stakeholders, um, and what's happening out there um, in the uh, in the technology using technology and the internet um, is a little bit like science fiction. Uh, in fact, we can make it up every day and experiment. Um, we are driven. The Sunlight Foundation is driven um, by uh, the commitment that we want democracy to work for all of us, not just the best connected or well healed. We're nonpartisan, but we are not neutral in this belief of um, what makes a democracy work and the power of technology. So what do we think about the role of money uh, in the election? Um, so a bit of a summary uh, here. Um, despite the meme, the, the day after the election meme that money didn't matter, and I woke up in the morning, I heard that meme, and I said, didn't matter much to the Democrats? Really? Um, we. Uh, 
spent the most ever in a presidential election year. You, uh, Matea, had that number, six billion. President Obama raised one billion dollars in his committee and his associated committees. That's a lot of money, and in doing that, I'll put a number on yours. He, it's been calculated he attended 200 fundraisers, and that is almost uh, three times what the last sitting president raised, the, the, who was the largest spender. And that was George Bush, and he attended 74 fun fundraisers. And Obama went to 200 fundraisers. Um, that, that goes into the, the uh, what kind of time are we spending uh, raising this kind of money argument. Um, just for example, in terms of, you know, did money really matter in the Senate, the Democratic Committee outraised the Republican Committee by $12 million. Interesting results. Tell me money didn't matter. In the House, the, uh, the Republican Committee outraised the Democrats by $14 million. Tell me again, money didn't matter. There was $500 million spent by outside committees in October alone. $500 million in October alone. $37 million spent in the last weekend. I don't know about you, but my TV was off. Um, Super PACs raised $650 million in the last two weeks, and 49 of them didn't start spending their money until after the reporting date before the election passed. That's $32 million, which ultimately will be reported, but after it's too late to know who spent the money. The races with the most outside spending, uh, presidential, $600 million. Virginia, $50 million. We got a lot of that on radio here, didn't we, in television. Wisconsin, outside money, $44 million. Ohio, $36 million. Indiana, 31 million. Those numbers are all somewhat subject to change. There were seven Senate races that cost 40 million each, not all together. Virginia, Massachusetts, Ohio, Wisconsin, Connecticut, Nevada, and Montana. $40 million in Montana? Someone has lost their minds. Uh, who gave this money? You know, uh, Sunlight uh, did an analysis um, in the early days of Occupy Wall Street when, when the, the meme became the 1% of the 1%. And we discovered then, um, or actually we confirmed some earlier numbers, that less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans give political money in amounts over $200. And it is safe to say that even though, in particular, the Obama campaign raised um, 33 percent of their money in, in contributions under $200, that that same uh, figure will hold. So less than one-tenth of one percent of Americans basically gave uh, the money that mattered in, in this election. Okay, the more secret money, $300 million, um, in dark money, that is money that is not reported at any point, any time. And I agree with um, uh, uh, Michael Copps that uh, that the delayed reporting of super PACs is really a serious problem. I think, you know, delayed disclosure is, is like denied disclosure. Um, but we actually do separate out the money that is not reported. That's 300 million. As I mentioned, 32 million um, uh, of the super PAC money not reported until after the election. And there still are some mysteries out there, unless you guys have solved them. The Freedom Works, the contribution from Freedom Works, from something called the Specialty Corp. Corporation founded in September uh, was funneling funneling uh, 5.3 million dollars um, into for the Freedom Works Pack. We have no idea who, what, when, or where that is. Uh, what was the return on investment? Uh, this is an analysis we did immediately after the election. Not so good for the Republicans in the presidential race. Pretty good in the House races. Not so bad for the Democrats in the Senate races. Not bad at all for the presidents, for the presidential race for the Democrats. But we really will not know the answer to that until um, we see how this plays out, how the special interest money that funded all the campaigns, uh, winners and losers, uh, pay off in this legislative agenda. A couple of more takeaways. Um, as long as candidates act as if money matters, it will. Uh, and it fuels the arms race mentality. Even the threat of future super PAC and dark money spending uh, gets the attention of candidates, and it will make them more timid to propose solutions uh, that that uh, their outside that these outside funders may not um, appreciate. 
Uh, big donors will always have great influence and leverage as the cost of election increases, and we've seen no indication that the cost of elections is going to go down. Um, and along those same lines, um, those who give get. So let's take a second, because Sunlight is very focused in, in looking at all kinds of data to not only tell who financed and who lobbied for, um, uh, for certain candidates, but what do they get in return? So let's look at the, the, the legislation that's pending in Congress right now, the fiscal cliff, right? The fiscal cliff provides cover for extending tax, tax cuts and spending. Uh, the contractors, uh, defense contractors, are looking to restore Pentagon uh, purchasing power. Hedge funds are looking to preserve a lower tax rate. Um, the health insurance and pharmaceutical industries, uh, which made out pretty well under the budget deal, are looking to preserve all of that. Uh, the unions, AARP and groups that are fighting to uh, Medicare and Social Security, it is, it is a vast sort of almost money palooza focused on this fiscal cliff issue. And we wonder why it's so difficult to make decisions. It's not just because we're divided in partisan ways, but we have the money in there as acting as that as well. Big issues coming up in the 113th Congress, fundamental tax reform. Um, uh, uh, it's obviously an issue that real estate, financial, health care, energy, manufacturing, an array of interests are, um, are going to be aligning with each other in odd combinations. Sunlight builds ways for you to follow all of this. So if you're interested in fundamental tax reform, you might look at our Influence Explorer that, that, that will reveal how these companies have dug in deep, how much they've given, how much they spend lobbying, and what they've already gotten from government. Um, or you might look at our lobbyist registration tracker, which tracks in real time who is registering for these, in, uh, these, um, uh, these companies and how much is, is being spent. We have that, that registration information in real time. Another issue coming up, energy. Um, production of national, uh, natural gas is booming in the U.S., oil production also booming. Um, and the way this plays out is very much affected by the regulations that are constantly being written and adjusted. Um, if you want to follow that, we have a, a new um, project. I don't know if I'm supposed to announce it, but I will anyway. It's not up yet. It's called Docket Wrench. Um, and this takes the entire regulatory structure uh, at regulations.gov and makes it easily accessible um, for you to be able to see who's commenting on what and what they're asking for and to be able to follow that thread. Another big issue, it's going to be a perennial, is health care. Uh, the the um, Affordable Health Care Act is incredibly complex. Regulations are still being written. Um, and everyone will be, um, you know, uh, on board there. Uh, we have several tools that you could use, actually, to, to look at this. One is called Scout, which gives you an alert every time a piece of legislation involving an issue that you're concerned about is moving not only in Congress, but in every state legislature as well. So we, we scrape all of that information, and you can get daily alerts. It's actually rather frightening. Uh, or you could look at our Open States Project, which takes all the legislation from all 50 states. There are about 40 up now. The rest are coming early in the new year. Um, or our uh, flagship site called Open Congress. These are ways for you not only to get the information, but to engage in um, uh, with your member of Congress, with your peers, uh, with your friends that you make who are concerned about the same issues. Uh, uh, a fourth issue that's coming up is financial regulation. Um, not to um, a surprising extent, really, um, the financial industry actually moved out of the top tier of the president's uh, donors and became the top tier of Mitt Romney's donors. Uh, the financial Wall Street uh, was the fourth largest donor to the first Obama campaign. It's now the tenth largest donor to the Obama campaign. Maybe that'll give him a little bit of wiggle room there, but not clear. Um, what are they doing? What do they want in terms of the regulations? Uh, how is that going to happen? We have a tracker called the Dodd Frank Tracker. Uh, because the legislation requires every lobbyist who meets with any agency to register, we take that information from all four of those agencies, scrape it, put it together. You should you should be following it if you're concerned about that process. Um, to paraphrase Huey Long, those who give, get. And that is the dominant um, uh, power of money in politics. A um, few other takeaways. Candidates spent more money, uh, more time fundraising uh, and less time um, doing the business of government, whether they were legislating or in the executive. 
Um, endless misleading campaign ads fueled by big money breeds distrust, disillusionment, and distraction, a, a point that, that Craig and others have made, um, and a point that I think all of us agree on, super PACs and dark money and big money in politics is not going away. They will change tactics, and they will still be players. Um, and it will get smarter, as uh, Commissioner Cobb said. Um, enhanced disclosure is clearly the next step, and not just for campaign contributions, but for lobbyist reporting as well, because their work is enhanced uh, even more so by the threat of, of uh, uh, bigger and, and more spending. Um, something I think everyone of uh, the, the panelists will agree is that it is simply an anathema to American democracy to have so much hidden or delayed reporting on spending of what fuels our politics, and it has to change. Uh, Sunlight is very active in trying to uh, rejuvenate some of uh, this legislation that would require online, real-time reporting of the super PAC money, of the uh, uh, get better enforcement of the dark money reporting, uh, and to move all of the uh, political influence money online to online real-time reporting for all of us to access and have information about. Thank you. So we're going to spend maybe 15 minutes or so uh, speaking among ourselves, uh, but I hope you listen in. Um, and I have, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask two sort of perhaps unrelated questions. Uh, one is whether social media made any difference at all in this election and whether dark money had any impact on the use of social media. Um, the other question is, is there a role or what was the role for public media, uh, public television, and public radio? And uh, why don't I start with you, Craig, because you're right uh, next to me. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I may defer to some of my colleagues to, you know, for, for hard, hard facts on social media. I think that, you know, there's no question social media played a role in the election and in how a lot of people, you know, got their information, talked about the election. But, you know, I think by and large still that was in reaction to things that were happening uh, in, in the mainstream, that the narrative uh, really wasn't being driven in that space. So, you know, the internet spending, uh, you know, broadly pales in comparison. It, it grows each cycle, but compared to what, they're, what, what folks are putting on TV. Now, some in, in a post-election context, I noticed the, uh, with the big uh, Democratic super PAC that used to, for the folks who used to be in the White House were saying, oh, well, of course it was our, our innovative social media spending that made the difference. Uh, I didn't see necessarily uh, the facts there. So I think social media is incredibly important, a free and open internet where you can get to all of the great tools that Ellen makes key, but it's not, it's not a substitute. And the fact is that most people, uh, most voters, were still getting their information. More of them are getting it from the internet, but the majority, of their number one source was still television, uh, and I think a lot of it was in reaction to that. Uh, public media, uh, you know, differences if we're talking about television and radio, um, I think, uh, you know, in, in many ways it could be the missing link here. Uh, Fortunately, at least thus far, the public media stations are not taking super PAC underwriting. Uh, hopefully the courts will come to their senses and close that door. Uh, I, you know, I think it's, uh, it's sort of an incomplete report card. You know, I think NPR continues to invest in reporting. I think that's, that's great to see. Um, but when it comes to local journalism, when it comes to local races, uh, there are huge gaps. So when you look at the, the, the real falling apart of a lot of the commercial media, especially at the local level, uh, smaller and mid-sized newspapers, uh, local TV and radio, radio reporting almost disappearing, uh, public media potentially could fill that gap. Uh, but of course, they're uh, you know fighting for table scraps in Congress, uh, and the story for them in this election was that Mitt Romney took shots at Big Bird. Uh, now, if you ask me, the, that was uh, you know maybe the one memorable thing in that debate. And public media has this incredible opportunity that wow, millions of people love us. We should go uh, get some more money. Uh, we were actually winning these fights. That's what I think. Uh, when you hear from public media, they say like. 
please don't use our branded products, uh, you know, in your activism. So I, I think there's, some, there's, there's a way to go. I do think an investment in public media could be a very powerful uh, force in the other direction, um, but we, we have to make that investment, and folks like PBS have to be willing to really follow through with, with a commitment to local journalism. Well, I can speak just briefly to the role social media plays in our reporting, which is it's incredibly helpful. I think one of the things that Twitter has done is kind of sped up, if possible, the competitive metabolism among those of us covering money and politics. So on FEC night, we're constantly, you know, one eye on the Twitter stream as we're like digging through the FEC files. And when we see, you know, some folks alight on different names, you know, we're chasing down those rabbit holes as well. So it definitely helps, I think, um, kind of the small cadre of us focused on this to really uh, see what's out there in, in a, a, a more rapid way. And obviously, some of the online tools that Sunlight has and some of the other organizations have been incredibly helpful to try to burrow down. Um, I do think that this is, um, the reporting on this is incredibly complicated. And it requires a lot of time. And it requires a lot of news hole, which is something we're always arguing for. So um, while Twitter definitely helps us get our stories out, um, they really, really can't tell even a fraction of it in 140 characters. Yeah. Um, I would just add on, um, on social media, for me, um, it, while it is it's sort of an early warning system about what's happening, it's a tool to engage citizens who would not be engaged before. It's easy, even if they just read what's happening. It's fascinating to me that, you know, my, you know, my cousin might actually be following politics in this way, and if they didn't have easy access to social media, they would not be doing it this way. So now I also have a confession to make. I really don't watch television. But on election night, I tried to turn on the television, and it wouldn't turn on. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, I am really in deep trouble. So all that I did on election night was online. It was the most peaceful, almost blissful experience. <laughs> I had my Twitter stream. I had three or four screens open to, you know, the, the Times and CNN um, and maybe the Washington Post. And I was just watching and I was filtering myself. And it was actually a wonderful experience. So I doubt that anybody else probably did it that way. But, but, but the, 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 the brilliance of social media is that it allows people that have never heard of Common Cause or Sunlight or Free Press to engage with their neighbors and their friends and other people they trust and respect. Uh, and so we reach a much broader audience that we never had access to before. Um, so I'll speak just real briefly on social media. Not that I know that much about it myself, but my very first uh, doctoral student just defended her dissertation this past spring. Um, and her dissertation was on social media and how it may um, affect politics. Because I'm an academic, I've been trained for a really long time not to believe anything until people have been able to show it conclusively, not just in one, but in a series of studies. So just because lots of people use social media doesn't automatically mean that social media matters or that people are responsive to it in any way. Um, my graduate student was convinced that it mattered. I was less convinced because I'm an academic, so I'm not convinced until I see all the studies. And so her dissertation was actually doing a series of experiments trying to show the extent to which people are able to learn about politics via um, social media. So one experiment, she asked people to friend um, a fake profile. And people were randomly signed to, to different fake profiles. This is before Facebook had tools that allowed for a lot more um, ability to sort of choose who receives various messages. Um, and one of these fake profiles, they mostly had the same content, but one of them had a couple of extra posts, uh, information related to a mayoral election a, that was going on in Atlanta at the time. And it turns out that people actually do learn something about politics from their friends on Facebook, even if it's a friend that is a fake friend <laughs> that you are uh, have signed up for just because... Uh, you will in advance know one of the questions on the final exam. That's your incentive for signing up for the experiment. Uh, she did uh, another follow-up experiment where she did a much more extensive thing, again, recruiting people to, to friend a profile uh, in Facebook and then asking people, uh, and then people got messages encouraging to vote in the 2010 election, and she actually went and looked at the voter file and saw that there was a tremendous effect in via social media for getting people 
to vote. So again, it's random assignment, so only some people are getting the pro-voting message. And the boost in turnout for people who study turnout was dramatic. It was an 8% boost in turnout. Now, there are reasons why that number, I think, is so large and seems implausibly large for people who study turnout. These are mostly college students. Um, and so I think you have probably you know, less voting history, less um, uh, habituation about voting, but still a rather large effect. So social media can, um, you can now feel confident that there are some academics who are actually <laughs> looking at this and show that it does have an effect. There's been some other studies by some folks at, at UCSD as well. Uh, she's still looking for work, so if you are hiring, <laughs> Holly Teresi, she's awesome. I will give her a very strong recommendation. So let me just do a check to see if there are any questions about dark money, media, the 2012 campaign, and the audience. Okay, we've, we've got a few. Before we get to those, I'm going to uh, put my cops on the spot and ask him to come up to the podium. And if you have any comments about what any of the other <coughs> presenters had to say, or if you have any questions, I want to give you. And then we'll have someone with a microphone come out to the audience, and we'll make sure we get your questions. Patrick, yes, please. Uh, I think we should, uh, should, should hear from the folks out there. I think this was a, an extremely uh, illuminating uh, uh, panel. It went to a lot of different uh, dimensions of, uh, of the subjects at hand, so I was uh, privileged to be uh, a part of it. I do have one question, if I can just ask one question. Uh, do we have any preliminary information on how the $6 billion that we're talking about breaks down as between the federal and the state races? You know, I mentioned in my remarks the importance of what goes on at the state level. We all know about the American Legislative Exchange Council and uh, its impact in drafting model bills and uh, uh, voter suppression and uh, telecommunications uh, and everything else. That's a, that's, that's a huge interest. Uh, ALEC flew under the radar for the better part of 40 years until Common Cause and uh, other groups uh, 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 brought it to light, and uh, the Moyers show uh, in particular also. Uh, do we have a feel for whether an increasing percentage of that money went to, uh, to state races uh, uh, this year, or is but it? Actually, that $6 billion is just for federal elections. Just for federal. So we actually don't have as good of a handle on the money spent in states for various reporting reasons. Is there any kind of estimate what goes on the state I, level I in past elections compared to federal? I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, unfortunately. That, would, that might be, uh, be a very illuminating figure to, uh, to hang out. Right. So uh, I understand there's a, is there a floating microphone around here somewhere? Thank you. Uh, why don't you come up front, <coughs> and let's start up front and then, and then, and then go back. And I think this gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much. My question concerns the role of the IRS in this, and this hasn't been mentioned. My understanding, which could be wrong, is that these groups that are, have a nonprofit status are supposed to be legitimate social welfare type groups pursuing various public social welfare causes. And that's the basis for them getting a tax-free status. My impression is that the IRS has fallen down totally in that regard and just seems to grant this status to these groups willy-nilly or after the fact? I mean, I'm wondering how many of these groups are now going to be active, allegedly, in social welfare causes now that the election is over. So my question to you all is, can the IRS be a tool or a vehicle for stricter enforcement to restrict some of these groups from their wild spending? I, I think you might have been uh, reading my email chain with some of our staff yesterday. <laughs> Uh, as we sort of figure out what to do, what can be done with these C4s, mostly C4 organizations, um, and you've hit the nail on the head. The IRS has to be pressured to do, um, to do a serious enforcement, and the rules also have to be changed. So I, I don't know them precisely, but it's something like if, and you probably do, if 40% um, of your activity is non-political, then you can get away with it. 
maybe that should be reduced to 10 percent, 5 percent, something like that. Um, but there is a, a new focus that has to be taken on the IRS uh, with respect to enforcement of these um, C4 organizations. I'll just jump in on that. One of the issues with the IRS enforcement is there is a conflict between the law and the regs, and the regs actually say that if you're a social welfare organization, then your primary purpose um, cannot be politics. And the law actually says something um, a little stricter about you're supposed to be solely focused on social welfare. So the primary purpose um, is really vague, and so I, uh, attorneys have come to interpret that as meaning you can spend 49% of your budget or less on politics and you'll be able to meet that standard. So what we see is a lot of groups spending all of this money in the campaign on um, electioneering or overtly political ads and then spending a lot on um, what Craig mentioned, these issue ads, which actually have a very <laughs> strong political sheen to them but count towards their social welfare component. So we'll see a lot of spending, I think, around the fiscal cliff because these groups are going to try to drive up the spending on the non-political side of their budget in order to meet that primary purpose test. Um. I just want to follow up on uh, Michael Copps's uh, comment about the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, we filed a, a whistleblower complaint with the IRS because for 40 years they're not a C4, they're a C3, and they claim on their uh, 990s that they do zero lobbying when in fact they do about 60 or 70 percent of their, their work is, is lobbying. And my question really relates to the fact and there's probably not a big answer to it, but we've talked about dark money. We've talked about the money spent in this election. We haven't really, I think, addressed some of the hidden actions. Uh, I served in Congress for 12 years. I know what lobbying looks like. A group like uh, ALEC uh, sits around in fancy resorts with a lot of corporate money uh, getting to know state legislators. And they then uh, turn around in that state legislation, not only um, restrictive laws on voting, but also support for the private sector prison industry, the private sector educational industry. I think money is corroding our political system in a deeper way, not just in campaigns. And we've got to make the flow of commentary that goes from the contributions made on political ads, the contributions made directly to the candidates, the hidden contributions made in fancy resorts to a whole group of state legislators and federal legislators who sneak in into those events. What, what are some of the solutions? How do we get at this? Uh, is public financing a possibility? Uh, should, in fact, uh, we have the, the White House have a a White House conference on reform, January, February, March, where the president puts his arm around uh, John McCain and says, let's fix the presidential finance uh, <laughs> questions. Um, you know, ever since Watergate, we up until the 08 election, we had limits on all of this time. And I'm not sure any of us want, regardless our, of our political affiliation, our president spending all of those days raising money for their reelection in the first term, which, uh, you know, with a complication of issues. So the question is, what do we do about it? How do we uh, begin to get real reform? Uh, well, you're looking at me, Bob, so <laughs> I know my colleague to my right and my immediate left are not going to comment on this I question. yield to the gentlewoman <laughs> from Sunlight. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a really nutty difficult, complicated problem. Um, but what drives a lot of the Sunlight Foundation's work is getting to the data points that illustrate precisely uh, what you are describing. So it's one site that I mentioned, Influence Explorer. If you put in General Electric, you will see whatever data we have been able to collect to date that literally is mashed together and within seconds you will see General Electric's federal contributions and their state contributions. So the money doesn't stop, as you indicated, you know, at the federal border or at a state border. These big players are everywhere because the issues at the state legislatures are, is important for them, um, as is greening candidates at the state level to move up. Uh, as federal issues are. We add in 
um, issues like has General Electric ever been cited by the EPA for violations of environmental laws? Are they on a contractor misconduct list? Oh, do they receive uh, uh, government grants or contracts? How much do they receive? All of this is information that unfolds within seconds on the website. And the idea uh, is to provide a kind of uh, data commons, if you will, so that you really, through data, can tell the story of the power of the political money and the lobbying spent. We would love to have lobbying expenditures from all 50 states. I mean, the last time we calculated what it would take to do that is about a million dollars. We don't have the money to do that yet. Um, but these tools we want to put in the hands of, you know, uh, citizens uh, as well as the media to begin to tell the story that's based on data. And if you had this information in real time, you as an, uh, as an active advocate could actually stop bad stuff from happening. Um, you wouldn't have to wait until the C legislation, you know, uh, passed and say, oh, my God, what was Section 22A? Um, look what they did there. So the idea is to put this information online in real time. It is not a solution to the problem, but without it, we are completely, you talk about being in the dark, we are completely in the dark. And today, it is true, when we get mm -hmm. reports of just campaign contributions, you know, every quarter, it's the last quarter, it's like looking over your shoulder, or it's like looking at a video of a bank robbery, literally. <laughs> like, oh, that's who stole the money out of the bank. Yeah, I, I mean, so, I, I mean, I agree with all that, and I'm, been doing this, can I say this now, long enough. I mean, I remember as recently as 2004, if you even wanted to get like lobbying records, you'd actually have to go down to the Senate and ask them to print them out for you and you could take it back. I remember at Public Citizen, we were building our own databases and then hand coding that stuff in there. So we've come a long way. Those are, those are good steps. I think we should encourage it. Um, but we also have a political problem. And, you know, we hinted at it here a little bit, which is, you know, we sort of perceive that the Democrats are more in line with the reform agenda. But it's a little harder to motivate them when they win. Uh, and they're, they're happy to go. I, I've been to a couple events this week with members of Congress saying like, and yeah, we should also fix that system. But thank you for keeping those checks coming. And, and we're going we're gonna to have to confront that head on in some ways, I think. And there, there's going to have to, it's an organizing problem because there's going to have to be a belief that you could actually lose votes. Uh, because every four years, at least, if not every two, <coughs> They can say, like, yeah, 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 I am so for fixing this system. Isn't it terrible? But really, right now, we need the cash. Um, and, and until we can sort of interrupt that, and I think actually part of that is confronting this narrative that's come out of this election. Ellen, both Ellen and Matea had hinted at it, which is kind of like, money didn't matter. But no, I mean, it really did matter uh, to, to the victors as well uh, and, and hold them accountable there. So I know that's something Common Cause uh, it, as well, but it's going to be champion building. Uh, you know, Bob Edgar is not on the Hill anymore, unfortunately, um, but uh, there may be others there who we can, we can start to build uh, for, for a longer term thing and then combine it with being able to put that information uh, that, that Ellen and her colleagues are, are, are digging up, uh, you know, right in their face and make that case. So that would be my argument. You know, there's I, a... I, I, if I may, can I actually just respond to that a surprise? So this is somebody <laughs> for, who's, uh, you know, obviously a couple of steps further re removed. Is that one way to think about it, and I, th I think that El Ellen is right, that focusing on disclosure is really important because as long as there are people that want government to do what they want, whether that be citizens or whether that be extremely wealthy interests who want a very particularized benefit, they're going to try and spend money in pursuit of that. So it's not just thinking about specifically how to remove money from the process entirely because I don't think that's possible. If you take away all current avenues for spending money, then people will find another way to spend money to try and get what they want. So the idea is try to sort of focus it in the ways that are probably least destructive. There's uh, the old statement in Pogo, we've met the enemy and the enemy is us, but I think I would change that for here. We met the friend and the friend of us, and I think more of the same, much more of the same is part of the answer. I mean, you guys and the groups in this room made a difference at the grassroots. You did finally get word out on ALEC, and as a result, 40, 50 companies have withdrawn uh, their memberships. Those billboards that Clear Channel put up did go down 
before the election. Instances of voter suppression were actually tackled and, and resolved that might not otherwise have been resolved. So it's, uh, it's ultimately grassroots. We know there's not going to be that kind of White House conference uh, probably where it's a, a kumbaya moment on, on political reform. And, uh, and getting rid of dark money. It would be nice if we could. We ought, to, we ought to try to generate that. But ultimately, it's striking while the issue is hot, and that's right now, while memories of those ads are ringing and it's pressure from the grassroots, so when that senator or congressman uh, goes home and has that town hall meeting next month, even though it's after the election, somebody says, what'd you all do about uh, fixing that problem with campaign financing? And the more we get these facts out, and they're dramatic facts, and people can understand those facts, hits them right between the eyes, do it while it's still <coughs> burning in their memories, and there's a chance to, uh, uh, to do something. Uh, so as I, uh, as I said before, let's, let's get an agenda of reform, and, and this is right at the top of that, and, uh, and, and take it to the grassroots, which I think is disposed to understand it, and I think that's step number one, and maybe two and three and four too. This has been very interesting and very informative, um, but it also is perhaps uh, an indicator of continuation of the idea of American exceptionalism. Um, during the discussion about the health bill, what was being done in other countries was often held up as uh, sign of what was possible or impossible in America. And uh, also as a measuring stick for uh, what was being done in America. I, uh, I have heard nothing about, uh, nothing in this meeting today, uh, there's been no reference to other countries and the experience of other countries. Uh, a country that I have some familiarity with is Australia. And Australia uh, has, I think, very democratic, uh, a very democratic system. It's not perfect. But one thing, one way they get rid of having to spend a lot of money is to require everyone to cast a ballot. You don't have to vote. You can write an obscenity on it. But you've <laughs> got to pat, you've got to cast a ballot. That means that there's no money spent on getting people to the polls or convincing other people their votes aren't going to count. You have a, a very small fee, I think about a uh, fine, $15, $20, if you don't cast a ballot, but that's a part of it. Um, another is that the major costs of um, uh, television and, and uh, uh, radio advertising are paid for by the taxpayer. Uh, the, the amount of uh, time that the candidates get uh, is apportioned, uh, and uh, candidates who don't get more than a certain percentage of the vote, uh, I think it's about 5% or so, uh, have to pay a certain fee. In other words, this is a discouragement of people who are just coming in for the fun of it. Actually, when we were living in Australia, where we lived for 23 years, uh, the, uh, one of the, uh, the brother of a man who did some work for us, um, who happened to be a French immigrant, uh, the brother uh, ran as a candidate on the sun-dried tomato party. Uh, he didn't get the 5% of the vote, so he had to pay uh, the cost of the advertising. But the point is that there are things you can do. Uh, also, uh, there isn't this usual uh, uh, rearrangement of uh, districts for the members of parliament. Um, uh, done by, say, the local legislature and whichever party is in control can decide where to gerrymander it. That isn't possible. It's done by a government body that appoints certain experts in demography, geography, economics, what have you, to determine the character of these districts. Um, th this, isn't, this isn't rocket science. This is pretty simple stuff. And uh, I would think it would uh, make for a, uh, that, so a real progress in the United States, too. You know, I, th I think uh, a country that fails to learn from the experience of others really does so at its own, uh, own great peril. When I was at the FCC, I was constantly 
<coughs> encouraging myself to uh, to find out what others were doing. And on every subject just about that came before us, there were lessons to be learned. How do you get broadband ubiquitously deployed and adopted? So many interesting experiments going on in other countries who were far outpacing us in their success in increasing broadband penetration. It took us a long time, I don't know if we have yet, to learn from all of those lessons, looking at how do you restore competitiveness in telecommunications and get away from monopolies and duopolies and, and open the field with lots of, lots of other experiments in other countries, uh, structural separation, all kinds of things. Uh, I'm not saying we just should go and take those and apply them to a situation. I'm, I much like the term exceptionalism, but we are a unique country. It doesn't mean we have to buy in exclusively to what others are saying, but there are lessons to be learned. We're talking about public uh, broadcasting. Uh, here was Craig and the folks at Free Press who told us that everyone in this room each year is paying $1.35 toward the support of public media compared to a Britain where it's 50 or $60, or some of the Scandinavian countries where it's three and $400 supporting media. And again, those media systems are different. I'm not saying send everybody a bill for 400 bucks, but maybe that $1.35 doesn't quite cut it in uh, uh, trying to determine what the role of public media should be in our country. So, uh, so I think you raise uh, a good and valid uh, point, and uh, I thank you for it. Thank, thank you for this panel. Um, my name is Lorelai Kelly. I'm here at the Open Technology Institute at New America Foundation. Um, I had the good fortune or the interesting uh, experience of being at a political scientist conference the day after the election. And uh, the panels were like academics unplugged. Uh, Jason, you can, you can imagine. But the most interesting comment I heard about the money and politics problem was that uh, it should only be looked at at the presidential level because the down ballot races are a completely different set of concerns for money in the system. But also that uh, Romney didn't, because he had so much money outside the system, th that he wasn't held accountable in the same way and that he didn't have to go to, through a sort of emotionally intelligent natural selection process of, um, a, of sort of raising money from so many different people from a much broader domain and also do the in-person um, you know, social etiquette of getting elected and that made him more and more out of touch. And, and in comparison to Obama, he just couldn't compete. And I just thought this was a really interesting, more subtle analysis of uh, the, the destruction that money in politics plays and that perhaps it might leverage a conversation among real you know, conservatives in, in the GOP that want to do something about this problem. And, and combined with things like the real bitterness that ensued after Senator Luger was beat in the primary, that it, have you heard anything about a reform movement specifically on this issue coming from the GOP, especially the sort of traditional stalwarts of the party? And can we look forward to helping that? Well, I can speak to, uh, there, there, it, there is definitely some talk on the Hill among Republicans who have been targeted by this spending that oh, we might want to do something about this now. Um, but I don't think it's going to take the form in which uh, Democrats have been advocating for, which is, um, you know, some kind of reform the system that would actually do away with super PACs or would push for extensive disclosure. As I said, there's a real push from the Republican point of view to just roll back contribution limits on candidates and and parties. So I think that would probably lead to even more increased spending. Um, and a as to the point about uh, Governor Romney, he did actually um, raise almost as much money as President Obama in the end, I think he's going to be on track to raise about $900 million. A lot of that was for the primary system. His fundraising was more disproportionately relied on by um, large donors who were giving checks of about five figures. And so uh, he spent a lot of time courting those folks, a lot of time in rooms with wealthy donors. Um, and I think the Obama campaign talked about yesterday how they had this kind of historic reliance on online fundraising. They raised, um, more, I think, more than half a million dollars just from contributions online. And so that definitely, while the president did a, a lot of fundraising, as Ellen pointed out, I think Governor Romney had to do probably a lot more glad handing in those rooms. Um, so I don't, I, I don't necessarily know that fundraising is a way that puts you in touch with the, the average person, but um, I think that there's, um, that, that both candidates had to do their, their fair share of meeting with wealthy donors and, and getting bundlers for their campaigns. Yeah. 
I, I would um, I would agree with that. I mean, I think it's you know as I said earlier, it's less than one tenth of one percent of people who are giving um, you know the political money that matters to these candidates contributions over two hundred dollars. They are not people like those of us in the room in terms of if I could guess what our you know our incomes look like. Um, uh, or what our interests are, or what our agenda is. That at a point, at one of my observations, which which might fit into something that you learned, is I think the super PAC's role in the Republican race was significant. I mean, every time there was a challenge to Romney, the, his his super PACs would beat down that challenger, and he would emerge unscathed. He can he could not focus on a general election message because he, because the campaign was prolonged with candidates who might be considered fringe. Um, and, you know, it's, some will say it enhanced the debate in the Republican primary and kept candidates in longer, and so they had a more healthy debate. But I really think super PACs picked Mitt Romney, um, and then it was his natural proclivity, that was his class, that's who gives political money to keep him isolated, to keep him fundraising. Um, the president has the same problem. You know, he raised a lot of money from a lot of very wealthy people who have a lot of interest before the, 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 the federal government and the state governments. Um, by the way, I think I disagree with your comment about the down ballot, the impact of money in down, in down ballot races. I think it's every bit as, uh, as important, and maybe more so because there's less money and maybe, you know, uh, you know really a $5,000 contribution can make a significant difference to a candidate, you know, in a state house. Thanks. I'm Andre Sobozo, and I'm a chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company based in Detroit, Michigan, and um, another uh, water filtration equipment in Malaysia called Archeron. But anyway, my question is this. Would it be, and, and it's addressed to your comments, sir, about the um, distortion uh, of our politics by these congressional redistricting, and the gentleman that asked about the Australian compulsory voting was part of what I was going to ask, but you addressed that very well. The other part of it was, do you think it would be helpful if we got rid of the Electoral College and just had direct voting so that every, you know, one person, one vote? And that's actually my question. I have a comment that it's not a question, and it's just about the other gentleman's point on learning from other countries. Uh, I just don't think we, we can do it. But anyway, the country I work in and used to represent General Electric in the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, <coughs> has 25% women in parliament. Women would never be subjected to the indignities there. That, for example, women in my state, Virginia, are with, you know, compulsory ultrasound exams and things like that. And um, also, because they've achieved true separation of church and state, they've, next year, the parliament will take up the issue of same-sex marriage in the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. I thought I'd probably teed up enough controversial issues without getting into, <laughs> a, uh, <laughs> into the Electoral uh, College. I think there was a piece in the paper about it uh, this morning. It's a debate that's been going on for a long, uh, long time. The Electoral College exists for totally uh, historically uh, anachronistic uh, reasons going back to the founding of the Republic. Uh, on its uh, face, it is uh, undemocratic, uh, but I think Certainly we need to have a, a calm and a reason and a dispassionate uh, discussion in this country about it. Again, I think the time is, uh, uh, is probably right to do that. Uh, if pushed really hard on it, you, I, I think you'd have to say at this point, uh, it's not reflecting our democracy, but I wouldn't want to make a final decision until uh, till we have that kind of, uh, of a debate. So we've got about five minutes left. We've got more questions than we can handle. Uh, let me try to do this. Let me take two questions at once, see if we can get some answers and get some other two questions. We have this young lady here with the scarf, and there's a young lady in the far back who's been very patient. Mm -hmm. and, and then we'll get to Tim, and I think there was another. Yeah. Please, go ahead. My question is um, whether there is enough of a common broad understanding of and belief in a common good, a public interest, or has that been eroded by 30, 40 plus years of privatization and, you know, similar forces? Hello. 
Hello, I have a fairly technical question. I also want to commend Ellen in particular because if you look at the two groups that she started, the Center for Responsive Politics, Sunlight Foundation, there's probably been no other organizations that have done more to reveal what's going on in American politics and it's been incredibly important. I have a fairly technical question, but I think it comes out of this question about uh, how the, the money was used in this election. We keep hearing these reports that the outside groups were charged a, a, a fair amount of money, the television stations made a lot of money, and that the money that was given directly to the candidates was used more efficiently because they got lowest unit rate. However, I think many people in this room understand that lowest unit rate is, rate is itself broken, that uh, the candidates, in fact, have been charged uh, way much more than they should have been because uh, they've had the threat of having their time preempted. Is anyone looking, uh, and particularly Mr. Copps, if you have any thoughts about how you would go about looking at, at fixing lowest unit rate at a time when it has been declared as been useful for the candidates? Well, it's an interesting question. You know, we're talking about a system where candidates go out and ask us for money so they can pay broadcasters to carry messages on the airwaves that we own in the first place is the, uh, uh, the essential uh, issue that you're, uh, uh, you're dealing with. Uh, I don't know if the FCC has an, uh, an, an interest in uh, uh, looking at that right now. Uh, I'm more interested in, in bringing some discipline to the system of, uh, of contributions, really, if I had to set a priority uh, than necessarily <coughs> getting into uh, uh, who's benefiting more, the candidates or the, or the super PACs. It's a, it's a legitimate question, but uh, uh, I think probably secondary to some of the issues we talked about today. Some of my panelists, friends here may disagree. I would just say, I mean, clearly the lowest unit rate was driven up by the inflation um, that was triggered by all the outside spending. So it definitely was another byproduct of, of the big money we saw. And any comment on the question of have we lost the sense of public interest? Yes. <laughs> well, just, just, eroded, just, but not lost completely. Just very briefly, but it, but it hasn't just been eroded because of the privatization you talked about. It's been eroded by the disinclination of government and the refusal of government to take one of its fundamental responsibilities seriously and in telecommunications that's the public interest convenience and necessity which is mentioned like 112 times in the telecommunications act and sometimes you get the impression that that just uh, hasn't taken a hold for the last 30 years at the uh, uh, at the FCC, I think we're doing a little better job now, but to really take it seriously is going to demand uh, a lot more. So if government is not sticking up for the public interest and nobody's talking about it, then the people kind of get a little more distant from the whole concept and it, it withers away. And that withering away has been uh, deadly destructive to uh, uh, civic dialogue and our system of government and our whole society. Craig, did you want to? Uh, we can keep going. I'll come back okay. to it. And so let's, let's do Tim and then up front. Hi, thanks. Um, this is, I'm, I'm just relaying a question that came to us over email from someone who's w watching the, um, the panel via the stream. And it was, for, it's a question for Ellen and it's regarding, it was had been mentioned by others, uh, this issue of, of, of down ballot candidates and issues. Um, and it was bolstered from my experience in Wisconsin, a lot of the, the super PACs and C4 groups that were active uh, at the state level were very local. And the question is, is there anything that, that a group like Sunlight can do to track local money, local non-for-profits that are advertising uh, in that way but may not be in the, uh, the federal database? And let's squeeze one last question in up front and then I think we're done. I'm John Boyer. I'm with the Media Stewards Project, which is advocating for public media, stronger public media in the United States. Um, the, the, I have a question uh, for all, everybody here um, about have you considered, uh, in my other hat as a citizen since July, I've been very involved in Northern Virginia where I live, on uh, getting out the vote. And, and it struck me that in the nine battleground states, an incredible machine was built. You know, I, you all know that, I suppose. These people came together and bonded 
and they've been talking for months about continuing this work after the election, like maybe taking a day or two off, and then we're going to get right back at it, right? And I think for everybody on the panel here, academically this needs to be studied, uh, but I'm just saying this, these groups exist, at least in these nine battleground states. These people have bonded. They're ready to go, right? And they put together the very things that have been talked about on this panel. Data, on the one hand, the, the, the tremendous amount of data, you probably all know what I'm talking about, right? And then the grassroots drawing in people, bonding with them day after day, week after week. This is a potent force. And this is something that I think Common Cause should be thinking about. And everyone, academics should be studying, free press should be involved in this. Have you thought about that? That's my question. We'd love to get our hands on that list. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, sure, I think there's tons of organizing lessons that come out of the campaign if you're, if you're an organizer, if you're using, certainly if you're using some kind of hybrid online and offline model as we are and a lot of the groups are, you have to look at what was done. Uh, politically, you know, maybe the big question is, you know, are those who do have that list, uh, the political campaign or campaigns, uh, you know, willing to sort of encourage or turn those folks loose on anything except for elections. Uh, and that remains to be seen, certainly in the first term, if we're talking about Obama for America, you know, not really. Uh, th thank you, amazing, we're getting you ready for next time. Mm, you know, we're, but we've kind of got this over here in this agenda, and oh, hey, there's the people, uh, you know, who uh, were at those 200 fundraisers, let's get them some jobs. Uh, and that, that's going to be the fight here in the, you know, in the next few weeks and months about, about whether that energy can translate into the kind of accountability. I think there's reasons to be optimistic. I think people are feeling energized, you know, who, who, whose candidate did well in this election. I think there's a lot of people who feel a weight lifted. Maybe they didn't know that was there. Uh, so, you know, it's an exciting time, um, but it's going to be those folks and maybe those personal connections being brought into these actual issues that will determine whether I think we can accomplish, uh, accomplish some of these things. And I um, forgot just what to, to quickly was. answer the, the question that came in online um, about the da down ballot candidates and issues, um, Sunlight gets its state campaign finance information uh, from the Institute on Money and State Politics, followthemoney.org. They do an amazing job of collecting the campaign finance information from all 50 states. But we have yet to find any single source for anything less than those House and Senate uh, state house races. Uh, and so we're looking into trying to figure out how to gather that information ourselves, uh, looking at uh, major cities, uh, finding out who has what online. So we're sort of in a reconnaissance period of doing that now. We believe that's really important in terms of scaling this issue both up and down, um, because I'm, I, I'm just convinced from my many years of experience that, it, that the money has that kind of information. And the same thing uh, about lobbying, not only at the local or municipal level, but also uh, in a global context. I mean, Australia is well known to be uh, ahead of most of the rest of the country. I was talking with colleagues in, um, in Chile last week, and they said, you know, we need to follow the money in politics, but nothing is reported. And I said, you really have to start from the grassroots to even get that information. So for us, we, we, we need to find that information. We need to do transparency to them if the governments at the local level uh, or the federal level are not yet providing us that information. We have to create the demand for it. Then we have to database it, and we have to get it out to people. Can I say one thing very, very quickly? It uh, has nothing to do with any of this, but <laughs> Todd O'Boyle uh, told me that I absolutely cannot step down from the stage here without reporting that he has successfully dragged me into the technology of the 21st century. <laughs> and you can, you can now follow us on t uh, Twitter at CopSam. <laughs> so, uh, CopSam, uh, Matea Gold, Ellen Miller, Jason Reifler, Craig Guerin, thank you. All very much, uh, excellent presentations, a wonderful panel, and thank you, audience, and for participating. And I think I think that does it. Thank you. Thank you.